Hi, I'm Dan, and in this video, we're going to go over the latest changes for the Bookstack 2025 November release. Now, there are some upgrade notices for this release, the major one of which is significant changes to the database structure. So for this one, please really double check that you have good backups before you make this upgrade. And these changes will also mean a longer database migration time when you're going through the update process. On large instances, it might be in the range of minutes rather than the usual seconds, but just allow it to finish doing its thing. So the major element of this release isn't really visible because it's about changes to the database structure used for Bookstack. So previously for the core content types like shelves, books, chapters and pages, each of these had their own database table, which kept things quite easy from a code logic and developer point of view. But in quite a lot of different areas within Bookstack, we show all of these different items within like a mixed list. For example, on the recently viewed and the favorites in this activity, and this is just on the homepage. So for these, we'd either have to do inefficient unions across those tables, or in some cases, we'd run queries per item type and then join those together in the output. So for this release, we've essentially merged all those tables together. So there's now one big entities table for all those content types that holds the main metadata that we might want to search across. And then we have other sort of sub tables, either just for pages or for the container types. So books, chapters and shelves that we can then join on to when we need that data. So what this means for an end user will hopefully typically be a much more responsive performance system as we have to perform less queries that are then more efficient while allowing us to do things without so many quirks or hacks. So just as an example, I'm here on the Bookstack live demo instance that's running 2507. And I've just run a search for A. And if we scroll to the bottom of the page, we just have A more results here. We do show the total count at the top, but we can't actually see how many are either on this page or how many pages there are. And that's because we were doing something awkward behind the scenes where we'd query out per content type and then join those together and then sort them by the term score. So if I jump back over to this version on this new release, I'll search A again. And so we still get the number of results, but if we scroll towards the bottom, we have proper pagination that we can then go through with a stable amount of results per page as well. And these factors also apply to the API. So the API search endpoint also had the same awkwardness where you can provide paging parameters like the other listing endpoints. Now in this release, you can. So next up is a change to how we display date times within Bookstack and how that relates to time zones. So in most areas of Bookstack, we actually show relative times, such as the ones here where it says created and updated three months ago. But you can see when I hover over these, we do show absolute times. And the same in some other areas, like if we go into revisions, then we do show absolute times here as well. And so for a long time, we've had the option that you can put in your Bookstack configuration of app time zone. And this would change the time zone that is actually stored within the database. And then it's that time zone that you see when you see those absolute time zones within the app. But this could create some awkwardness and confusion because from a database admin point of view, you might not expect to have non-UTC date stamps within the database. And when someone would change this to adapt Bookstack to their time zone, you'd have scenarios like creating new content would then be dated before content already exists. So to help be a bit more sensible when it comes to date times, within this release, we're introducing the app display time zone setting, which allows you to essentially separate the time zones that are used for storage and display. So typically what I'd probably advise to leave app time zone as its default, and then change app display time zone to the one for which applies to the majority of your book stack user base. And as an example, we'll just change this up just to see it in action. So we'll go Europe slash Berlin, and we'll save that. And looking at this top one, it's currently showing 126 UTC. We refresh, that's now changed to 1526 CEST. And the formatting of how we show these has also changed in this release. So before we didn't actually show the time zone, but that's now displayed to the user reading this understands exactly what time zone that applies to, just in case they're in a different time zone, for example. And we've also gone over all of the areas within the application where we show these absolute date times to standardize on this format across all of them. And this is all documented on our language and locale configuration page of the Bookstack docs. If you go to time zones, then it details these options here. And to find a list of the relevant time zones, because they use the PHP format, there is a link at the bottom here. So you just follow that through and narrow it down into your area and you can get a full list of valid options. 
And now for a new code language that's now supported within the Bookstack code editor, we have Groovy. So if you have Groovy code such as this, you'll now have the option within the sidebar for Groovy, which when clicked on, or when you put Groovy in the code language, or if you define that as part of a markdown code block, you will now get proper Groovy code highlighting. So next up is a change to the Bookstack create admin command that we provided so that system administrators have the ability to create new admin users via the command line. But we've got a couple of new options. The first is the generate password option, which when passed will automatically generate a long random password that will be assigned to the user that you're creating. So to give this a test run, we'll run the command create admin, pass in the email pool at example.com with the name of pool and we'll pass in the generate password option. So that has now created my admin user using the details that I provided and it's returned back the password that is generated. So when you pass that generate password option, you won't get any other kind of output, at least if you're using it in a non-interactive manner, you'll just get the password. So this is done so that it's easy to use in automation such as installation scripts where you might wanna create an initial admin user with a random password. And on that note, the other option that we've added is the initial option which we could just add to the command that we ran before. So with this option pass, Bookstack will look to the existing users. And if there's the existing admin at admin.com user that's created during a default Bookstack install, it will update that user account with the details provided. Otherwise, if that account doesn't exist within the database, it will look to see if there are any existing admin accounts within the system. And if it doesn't find any, it will create a new admin user. Otherwise, if it finds any existing admin users and there is no default admin user within the database, it will instead exit out with a specific return status and a warning to say it effectively hasn't created an admin user. If we run this, we can see we get here, non-default admin user already exists, skipping creation of new admin user. And now onto improvements and additions to the API, which I'll quickly run through. So first of all, the navigation in the API documentation has been improved. The sidebar has now been resorted. So after the docs, we have the main content types, so pages, chapters, books, and shelves, and then everything else after that in alphabetical order. And to make it easier, just because this list is getting quite long with all the different models that we've added. We've got the jump to section list up here. You can go here and then jump into a model, which brings us nicely onto comments, which we'll jump to. So there are now a full create, read, update, delete, and list endpoints for comments. So you've got full control over them via the API. And then to support this, the pages read endpoint, where you'd get the data for a specific page, will now include data for comments that's then broken down between active and archived. And the comment data here is formatted in a full tree-like structure in regards to comments and replies and general structure of threads. So you don't have to rebuild that structure on the client side. And then for the image gallery endpoints, we've got a couple of new ones here which we can use and that it is for getting the image data. So before there was a couple of scenarios where you might not be able to access the image data if you were using secure restricted images, for example. So now there's an endpoint where you can give it the image ID and then it's just slash data off the normal read endpoint and you'll get back a direct returned response of a data stream of that image data. And then for convenience, because you might not always have the ID, we've got another endpoint here which allows you to pass a URL as a query parameter to an image that's not just any random image but one in the Booksack system and it will do the same thing so return a stream of image data and of course this update brings a whole bunch of translation updates so once again a big thanks to the meticulous multilingual marvels of language that we have listed here that have provided updates to our translation since the last feature release so looking onward to the next release since this one was so focused on back-end structural changes, I'm aiming for the next release to be quite a fast one that's full of little features, hopefully in time for Christmas. One of which I plan to include is this one, which is a more purpose-built system to help resolve old URLs. Because we do already have an existing system in place that uses the page revision system to keep track of the book and page slugs. And then we use these if someone goes to a page that can't be found, we then look up to the revision system them to look at old URLs essentially to help resolve them but there's some limitations in this because it relies on revisions if a user cleans out the revisions or they go over the revision limit per page and they get recycled round then we can no longer resolve those URLs plus it doesn't fully track the other item types like books chapters and shelves 
So this will be a formalization of that system to ensure a more permanent, stable system to resolve these URLs that works across all content types. And then something for this release that I was aiming to do but didn't have time was to implement the initial developer API for the new WYSIWYG editor. So I've instead assigned that to the next release and it probably won't be extensive at all, It'll probably be very kind of surface level deep, but hopefully just enough to be useful in a lot of common scenarios so that developers can get started using it and provide feedback to then build it out further going forward. But that covers everything that I've got for this update. So again, sorry that there's not too many shiny new front end features that are directly visible as an end user. And as a reminder, please, please ensure you have good backups before upgrading. I'm quite nervous about this one just because I haven't made this extent of change to the database for the core content ever in the whole of Bookstack's lifetime. So I've done a lot of testing and checking, so it should be absolutely fine. But if you do upgrade, please let me know whether it's a success or failure. Of course, I can try and help you if it's a failure, but it's good to know when it's a success as well, just to understand the balance of how things are going in terms of a new release. But with that said, thank you very much for watching and I hope you have a wonderful day.